the society was facing or society saw some very important changes in the religious field also we can say there was some cataclysmic changes however one can say that there was a continuity as well as change in this whole aspect the continuity first generally it is stated that the bhakti which rose up in uh, this period particularly from uh, circa 600 to 900 with the rise of the uh, shaivite and the vaishnavite bhakti saints the nayanars and the alvars with intense devotional uh, um, aspirations to reach to meet the godhead in different forms or in different uh, um, through different means this element of intense devotional aspect which is generally considered to be a new thing in south india and some of the historians say that it was imported from north india under the sanskritic uh, sanskritization influences some of the historians as well as the historians of religion as well find that there was a continuity element of continuity involved in this thing in the late classical texts particularly paripadal and tirumurukarupadai we find all these elements present in paripadal we find that mal or mayon who is later uh, coalesced with uh, the concept of vishnu there was the concept of wholesome surrender to mal and uh, mal mayon or vishnu in paripadal in tirumurukarupadai we find the concept of pilgrimage very well available where the follower the disciple the pilgrim is going from place to place in search of murugan and number 2 murugan who was earlier confined to a particular eco type that is the kurinjitinai the mountain region he is now murugan is now being universalized that is his temple is available not only in kurinjitinai but also in all other tinais so the concept of the universalization of godhead was also present in the late classical texts the coalescing of sanskritic and the indigenous ideas which was uh, which played a very um, very important impetus behind the rise of the later bhakti was in the classical texts in the sangam texts the god has been depicted either as kadavul or anangu and devam anangu is a kind of attribute a kind of uh, quality which not uh, does not reside in the godhead but it is ascribed to some carriers here anangu is a kind of malevolent force which is generally available within the woman the uh, power anangu has to be chastised if she is married it works in the favor of the husband for the benefit of the husband but if a woman is un- unmarried or a widowed uh, person anangu can also destroy a whole city so anangu is a very important attribute of the godhead 
then you have the uh, concept of Kadavul and Murugan who is the residing uh, deity of Kurinji Tinai as well as in the Sangam text she is the god par excellence the uh, most potent god among the uh, gods and goddesses of Sangam uh, texts of the classical period Murugan can afflict particularly the young unmarried woman through his power of Anangu and then Ashaman Velan through his frenzied dance very idle, can dispel this force of Anangu from the woman. So Murugan becomes a very immediate immanent god compared to a very distant very universalized uh, concept of God that we find in the Sanskrit literature of this period. These two things come together as we have stated in the later classical texts. However, a very important change was also coming up in the period when the Pallavas and the uh, Avata Pichalukyans were ruling parts of the peninsular India as well as the Pandyans were ruling the far south. This is generally known as the rise of Bhakti movement. This period is known as the rise of the Bhakti movement dominated by the Nayanars and the Alvars. The Nayanars and the Alvars, their writings, their sayings show a kind of vehement condemnation of the heretical sects and the hagiographical literature even the inscriptional evidences also show that the earlier peaceful coexistence of different religious groups and houses come to an end in this period and the vengeance in which the bhakti poets condemn the Buddhists and the Jains and it is not just confined to words, simply words but sometimes it comes down to physical violence it shows that it was not just an esoteric ideological battle that was going on in South India but it involved some larger issues particularly the mundane issues like getting patronage. Apart from the fact that the Kalabras were supporting the heretical sects, the merchant groups residing in the towns also supported with very rich endowments given to this heretical sects. With the rise of this bhakti movement, the bhakti saints were trying to impress upon the powers of their superiority as well as through physical violence they were annihilating their most potent enemies the Shaivites and the Vaishnavites. The Shaivites if we take the case of the Shaivites first the hagiographical literature is Periyapuranam written by Seklar in the late 12th century. There a life history of 63 Shaivite saint poets have been given. Among these 63, the first or the most important uh, Bhakti saint, uh, saints, Nayanars, were Appar, also known as Tiru Navu Karasar, then Tiru Jnana Sambandar and Sundarar. Their compositions around 797 uh, poems has been composed as Tevaram. Appa 
before he got uh, converted into Shaivite uh, belief, was a staunch follower of the Jain uh, philosophy. And he was actually known as Dharmasena and was a resident of the most important Jain monastery in this period known as Pataliputra which is situated at Kuddalore. It is because of, according to the hagiographical literature, because of the exertions of his elder sister Tilakavati who prayed to Lord Shiva for bringing back her uh, beloved brother into the Shaivite fold that Shiva afflicted him with a very serious type of malady, a physical disease, incurable stomach ache. And when the Jains could not help him, he had to take recourse to his sister's help and then because of God's grace, he was relieved of this pain and he was reconverted into Shaivite belief. This resulted in very serious heart burn as well as break among the Jain ascetics who then impressed upon the king Mahindra Varman who was then a Jain and serious torture was inflicted upon Appar or Tirunavukarasar. It was because of many miracles that he performed through the grace of God that Mahindra Varman was convinced about the superiority of the Shaivite belief and he got himself converted into the Shaivite path. If we take the case of Tiru Gyana Sammandar, he was from a Brahmin family and from Shiali in Tanjur district. Very early in his age, it is said in the hagiographical literature that he was uh, um, through the help or, or grace of Parvati drank the divine grace uh, and uh, his father, very early in his age, came to realize the divinity or the divine power that has been bestowed upon his son and took this young child on his shoulder to different Tirthas. Sundarar was a bit later of these two. Sundarar also was a, a Brahmin, uh, 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 from a Brahmin family. He, most of his life, stayed at Tiruvarur and that's why he was known as Nambi Arur, the prince of Nambi, uh, uh, the uh, prince of Arur. And he uh, worshipped the god in a very familiar tone. That's why he is known as Tolan, that is the friend of the god. If we compare the way of worship among these three Shaivite saints, we find that Appar posits himself as a slave of the god. Sammandar shows himself as the son, child of the god, whereas uh, Sundarar plays the friend of the god's role. Apart from these three, or mover, that is the three, the great three, we also find Manikka Vajagar and taking these three, it becomes Nalvar, that is the great four. Manika Vasagar's poetry was full of very uh, passionate love for the 
God and his way is quite different from the first three. Also, Manika Vasagar's work is full of very harsh and sharp condemnation of the heretical sects. If we take the Vaishnavite uh, bhakti or saint, uh, saint poets, the hagiographical literature shows that they were 12 in number and unlike the Shaivite Nayanars, many of whom were apocryphal among the 63, all these 12 uh, figures, they were historical and their composition, all of them has composed poems, these compositions come together as Nala Yira Divya Pravandam, that is the holy 4000 compositions. The first three are Poihai, Pudam and Pei. Then we have some persons like uh, Kalvar, uh, Kallar uh, chieftain, uh, there were uh, Brahmins also like Periyalvar and there was a lady, the sole lady among this whole uh, lot of twelve that is Andal or Kodai. She is also known as Chudi Kudut Nachir who has exchanged her garland with the god that is here the Ranganatha of uh, Sri Rangam temple. Rise of the Bhakti saint poets had a very uh, important offshoot, a fallout of the rise of the temple institutions. South India full of very large temple institutions and this period 600 to 900 saw the growth of stone as well as structural temples and this is directly related with the kind of philosophy that was being preached by the bhakti saint poets. God is universal but he or she takes a particular or peculiar form in a particular site. So the site history, the Sthala Puranas become important and taking together the fact that the Agama Shastras also were coming up, very elaborate temple rituals came up in this period. The temple rituals then uh, necessitated growth of these uh, stone structures and there was a difference in the sense that some of the temples were then being patronized by the ruling family. The uh, concept of the king's temple, Reich temple becomes important. For instance, the whole complex of Mahavalipuram, Mamallapuram, which was developed during the time of Narasimha Varman or the Kailash, uh, Kailashesha temple in Kanchi, the Vaikuntha Perumal temple in Kanchi built by Nandi Varman uh, II, uh, Rajasimha uh, building the Shiva temple in Kanchi. These shows that the royal family playing a significant role in growth of large temples because they were patronized by either the king himself or the family members of the uh, um, royal family, they got huge endowments. And because of that, these temples became very, very rich, very, very large. But with the eclipse of the royal family, most of the Reich temple, the king's temple, the royal temple fell in disuse. But this was not the case in other instances where the temple were related with the important religious topography, the religious geography where the Nayanars, important Nayanars like Appar or uh, Sammandar or Sundarar, they went and sang for getting the grace of God or the uh, Buddha, uh, uh, 
Vaishnavites, they also played a similar role that is going to different places and singing the grace of God. The Buddhists and the Jain uh, religious institutions also remained important, though in a reduced fashion. The uh, Chinese pilgrims, Fahian or Yuan Chuang, when they came to uh, South India, particularly Yuan Chuang, who comes to South India around 642, before he embarked on his return journey, reaching in um, uh, Sri Lanka and then going back to China, he saw many monasteries, but most of them were by then deserted. This is supported by the um, informations that we get from Matto Bilash Prohoshan, which was written by Mahendra Varman, a kind of black comedy, where the talks of the Buddhist friars and nuns, particularly Devasoma, it shows that there was a very rich Buddhist monastery very near to Kanchi. In the case of Jains, first and foremost was Pataliputra that was in Kuddalore, but there were other uh, Jain monasteries as well uh, in Vedal, in different parts of South India, uh, there were uh, important Jain uh, monasteries uh, which continued with their presence. Though, because of the violence, because of the uh, virulent condemnation of the uh, uh, Bhakti saint poets as well as Bhakti catching the imagination of the common people, slowly the heretical sects became non-functional, particularly the Buddhists completely vanished from South India, particularly from the Tamil country.